Okay, well, welcome to this evening's webinar featuring activities from the NASA Night Sky Network's Shadows and Silhouettes Outreach Toolkit. NSN Outreach Toolkits come in boxes that usually look like this, and this is the, uh, um, the one, and so if you've got this little logo on it, then you know that you've got the right one. And these are filled with a plethora of Ziploc bags and a variety of materials with the that you need to do the activities. Your astronomy group may make regular use of them or they're unused on a shelf somewhere. And it is even possible your group may have an entire set of these toolkits that no one knows about. We found out that uh, there are some clubs that have every single one of them and a former member kept them in his basement or her basement and the newer board members don't know that they exist. And so it's an, and if you're not sure whether or not your club has these, you can always give uh, send an email to, um, to Dave Prosper and he can let you know whether or not your club has one of these. So our goal is to help you make use of what you already have or what you might have in the future as you log events and add to your collection of toolkits. Research has shown that educators and all of you are educators when you engage your membership and the public in your various events will make better use of resources when they receive some professional development in their use. This webinar is featuring activities from the Shadows and Silhouettes Toolkit. You can also find them on the Night Sky Network website, which I think Dave will put that link in the uh, chat window here shortly. So over the next half hour or so, we will show you a few of the activities in the toolkit. This is not meant to be exhaustive. This is gonna be just basically a survey of what's in the toolkit, and as well as give you a chance to share how you have used the toolkit and, and or how you engage your members of the public in learning more about eclipses or other shadow and silhouette type events. Transit certainly fit into that. So here's Vivian to get us started. Hi everybody, so good to see your faces. I love this format so I can actually see some of you while I'm talking to you. Nice to see familiar faces. Um, I just wanted to start with some really easy things that you can use from this toolkit. These are some of my favorites that I pull out all the time. There's the Skywatcher's Guide to the Moon. It's got a picture of the full moon and you can see some, it points out some of the features of it. Uh, it's also got a close up of Copernicus up here, um, the impact craters. And it's got uh, a reverse view that you can use if you're showing the moon through a telescope. So it's a really easy one to pick out. Uh, you could just make copies. I like to put our club's information on the back, upcoming events and things like that. Um, these are all available. Each of these are available on the website. Um, and you can search, just search moon and you would find most of these. One you wouldn't find around the moon because it's not about the moon is actually uh, called a trip around the triangle. And this is also a handout that you can just print double sided. Um, you fold it in half and it's got a picture of the summer triangle. Not useful right this minute, but very soon it will be um, summer again and not raining and snowing. Um, and this gives you a picture of the summer triangle. This toolkit was actually. Um, sponsored by the Kepler mission and it talks because the Kepler mission used transits in order to find uh, planets around distant stars. Um, we put this toolkit out in 2006 and there was an update to it in 2015. So oh, if you um, are seeing a small small picture you can click on my picture there and say pin video and that will um, you'll be able to see better in a larger view what I'm showing. I don't know if that helps. Uh, Daniel was just mentioning that the picture was so small. So. Or you can hit the uh, speaker view. If you're looking at the gallery view, you can switch to speaker view and it will isolate the one person who's speaking. Right, thank you, good point. Um, uh, so I hope that helps. Um, the, the Kepler mission, um, and the SETI Institute, the Search for Extraterrestrial, <laughs> Extraterrestrial Intelligence, uh, put this out with us, um, sponsored us to put this out for the Night Sky Network. And the trip around the triangle is used because Kepler, on the inside, it shows the search area for Kepler here between Vega and Deneb. And, um, and it shows some of the things you can see in the summer triangle. So, and it lists them kind of by types of objects. So it gives a little bit of context to what you're looking at in the summer. We encourage you to also have somebody pointing out the constellations because that's 
something that your visitors will be able to see wherever they are. In addition to, you can make check marks or try and see as many of these things in an evening as you can. It's a nice summer um, worksheet that you can do. We often hand out a sticker or something at the end if someone gets one from each category. Um, if we have a big group of people at the telescopes, we try and encourage them to look at a, what, something that's on the website. Yeah, all of these resources are on the Night Sky Network website. This one's called Trip Around the Triangle. Um, you can find lots of handouts and, um, and sky charts and many things that you can just print out and use on the Night Sky Network website. Then before I go on and pass this on, I want to show you one of my other very favorites. And this one was a Marnie Berenson. Uh, she, she designed this toolkit a long time ago. Many of you know her if you've been around the Night Sky Network for a while. Um, and this one has to do with the how the how night rises um, night doesn't fall it rises and it talks about if you have this is the earth here and of course the day side and the night side you can see pretty well after sunset if you look um, in, instead of looking at the west at the sunset if you look towards the east you can watch night rise and it's really beautiful it's called the belt of Venus um, and there have been lots of discussions in our group about why it's called that. Um, it's pretty interesting. Uh, but what happens is, as the Earth is turning, and I've got the sun shining on the Earth here, imagine my fingers are the atmosphere. Now, the atmosphere is not nearly so thick as my fingers, but uh, imagine them here. So as you're turning, the... I think, let's see if you can see it here. You can watch as the shadow creeps up my fingers, creeps up the atmosphere, and eventually you'll become night. And you can watch as, this is kind of a, it doesn't go the other way, obviously, but if you're coming around and the night will creep up on the atmosphere, so you'll see a band of a blue-gray kind of appear, and there are great pictures of it in the write-up. Each of these uh, right, each of these activities has a full write-up. We're just giving kind of the Cliff Notes version here. So you know, there's lots more detail to it. You can find out a lot more. Um, so those are a few of my favorites and really easy ones just to pick up and talk about. I think I'm passing it on to you, Brian, uh, for some uh, that involve a little bit more um, mood lighting. Yes, it's uh, definitely some mood lighting here, and uh, I've got the one camera obscured, and so I'm going to switch uh, cameras here. And so now I'm, I have this nice work surface here. I had to make some adjustments to the lights because a couple of things that are interesting, it's going to be kind of a challenge to do in here because one of the ideas is going along with this um, idea of shadows and objects casting their own shadows is why is it that the moon has phases? So what causes the moon phases? Well, there's lots of misconceptions that people have about the moon phases, and they don't quite get the notion that, oh, it's the moon shading, shadowing itself. And so one of the great things that you can do is that if you have some of these polystyrene balls, some of the smooth foam balls, and then impale them on a pencil or a skewer or something like that, and it's really cool that you can take this out and if the moon is up and Vivian's got a really great picture to show us here. So let's uh, see if Vivian can bring this picture up. I hope you see it now. Do you guys see the picture? And I cannot because I've got uh, um, that screen covered up right now. So got a thumbs up from Lindsay. Okay, we got a thumbs up. Okay, so fantastic. And so what this is, is you take this outside and if you have some sun that's still up, and this works really great when the moon is up during the daytime, is you hold this up until the shadow on the white ball matches the shadow or matches the phase that the moon is in. And so now you kind of, you have the configuration of what the moon, the actual moon is in around the earth is the same as the model moon, the white moon ball is around your head. And so then you could move it around your head with a very strong light source. The sun is a fantastic light source for this. And so you can move it around and see how the phases change. Um, it's really difficult to model that here in the studio. Uh, we played around with it for quite some time and couldn't quite overcome the, uh, uh, the geometry of how to do this um, because it really does require 
you to be able to move in three dimensions and really we only have a couple of dimensions that we can move in here. So Vivian, go ahead and uh, if you go ahead and stop sharing. We're seeing you now. You're seeing me now. And so <laughs> one of the things is that we can imagine that we have <laughs> the earth. And if you take and if you imagine that your head is in the position of the earth, and so I've got a light source off here to my right, and then you take the moon and you take the moon and you orbit it around the earth. You're not going to be able to see the phases change on this, but if you were on the earth in the middle there, you would be able to see the shadows change on the white ball just the same way that they change on the actual moon in, in orbit around the earth. That also answers a common question of does the moon rotate? We get that quite often from school children. They're um, tricked into that one often so they can decide for themselves. Yeah, so many different things. And so there, there are some other things you can do. So one of our favorite things to do too is, and this is something that didn't quite appear in there, but one of the things that we like to do with groups is we give them a set of three balls. And so here I have three balls, a ball here, a little bit smaller ball, and a much smaller ball here. And so I've got three balls here. And so we can challenge visitors to an event and say, two of these balls are in the correct size ratios to represent the Earth and the Moon. And so we can challenge them to select the two that they think represent the Earth and the Moon. So you might get, you know, there's a variety of combinations here that they could come up with. And it's kind of interesting to find out, well, why is it that you chose that particular pair? You know, what is it that you knew um, that you're drawing on to cause you to choose those two? And so you get a chance to work with that. And then if you actually give them some actual numbers, especially if you're working in a classroom setting, then you can have the people actually check to see which two actually represent the Earth and the Moon. It turns out that it's these two, the middle-sized one and the smallest one, because we've got the Earth model here is about four times the diameter of the Moon model here. And so you could line up four of these little ones, four of the little ones in a line across the Earth. And so then you could ask people, well, how far apart do you think that they are? Now, invariably, we've discovered that if we set these down and ask people to, you know, this is the size, they're two scale size-wise, and ask them to put them how far apart they think they should be, and we've put them down like this, invariably, what do you think that people do? So what do you think people do? And so you could, uh, you know, I mean, I can't see this, but maybe Vivian could. So, um, you know, drop something in the chat window or, or call something out, unmute yourself real quick. What do you think people typically do when you say, put these two objects to how far apart you think that they would be relative to one another? They leave them there and say, that's as far apart as they are. <laughs> yep, Ken. Yeah, Dave said they're too close. Yeah. Everybody thinks the moon, it looks so darn close. <laughs> it does. And so, you know, that's a very typical thing is that they leave it. Well, you put them down there, you must have put them down in the right spot. And so maybe they'll take it and they'll take the moon and they'll move. Well, let's see, that's not quite, uh, it's a little bit too close. So I'm going to move it to right there. <laughs> and they move it just a, you know, a little teeny tiny amount. And so what this does is that you get, you kind of find out what your visitors are thinking about, and then you can bring out an actual model. And so in the Shadows and Silhouettes toolkit, and a lot of you also got these for the eclipse last year, you can bring this out, and here's our yardstick, yardstick eclipse model. And so when you set this up, they are set on here 30 inches apart. We have a one inch diameter moon, or Earth down here, and the moon is 30 Earth diameters away, and so you could set that, and this is conveniently uh, in inches, and so one inch and then 30 inches away is our quarter inch moon. And so now we have this scale model where they are to scale size and to scale distance. And so people invariably are rather surprised. It's kind of like, wow, I had no idea it was that far away. 
then you can challenge them to see if they can make an eclipse. And so there's two kinds of eclipses, of course, solar eclipses and lunar eclipses. And so you can get them to be able to be the ones who make these. And so here I've got this set up here. I've got a whiteboard back here to help us to align the shadows. You discover that if you don't have a means to help align shadows, it becomes very, very challenging to get the shadows actually lined up. And so I use that to line up and it's going to be real challenged to be able to see this. Let's see if I can bring this a little bit closer. And so let's, if we line this up, and so there you might be able to see that we have the shadow from the small bead on the earth down there. You might be able to see that we have put it into a shadow. And so here we've made a solar eclipse. And then most people will hopefully know that the reverse is a lunar eclipse. And so on Sunday, we will have this where the moon is going into Earth's shadow. Another really great thing that you can do with this, uh, besides modeling eclipses, is that a lot of questions that people have, you know, how many people come in and say, oh, gee, what's a super moon? What's a micro moon? And so what does that really mean? And so what the, you, can, you can do is you can use this to be able to help demonstrate that. It turns out that a supermoon is where the moon is, our model moon, is about two inches closer, about two Earth's diameter uh, closer. It could be up to two Earth's diameter closer. So two inches closer, or during a micro moon, it might be two inches further away. And so you think, well, gee, that's not very much. And, you know, it's less than 10% in either direction. So that's kind of, there's another opportunity to use this model to help your visitors understand both micro moons and super moons. So now over to you, Dave. All righty. So we've got our little fake sun here, our snake light. Um, Going to be using this for a couple of activities uh, demonstrating the transit activity and for the Venus phases. Now, first, the uh, Venus or Mercury phases. Uh, it's called Why Does Venus Look Like the Moon? Um, this is a short demonstration, so you can grab one of the little stick models with the little moon on there. And one second, I'm just going to checking something on here. Let me. There we go. I'm just making sure I don't ramble. I have a timer. <laughs> so um, anyway, so what I recommend is holding a little stick like this, and I'm going to turn off the lights. So now we just have our beautiful fake sun and our beautiful model of Venus. So you can see it's just as you orbit it around the sun, you can already see how the phases are changing here. And um, you can actually, if you want to get really detailed with this, you can find some demos online um, that uh, also incorporate, you can find basically a map of the solar system at, at its current state. So if you're observing Venus, you can set this up next to your Venus observations and then make all the geometry match so that you can make it look exactly like Venus looks now, which right now it's like, it's a pretty thin, large crescent, which is pretty large and getting smaller as it's orbiting. Um, so, this also works for Mercury. If you want to make it redo the outer planets, you just put this on the other side of you. You'll need a much more powerful light source for that, though. Um, so, but then you can demonstrate why the outer planets don't really have phases and why that is. Um, but in the process of demonstrating this, you'll notice that you're also basically accidentally doing a transit itself. So, um, with this, you can. Use this basically the same setup, but you might want to grab um, a couple of sizes um, and see what works best for you with this and your guests. So we have a lot of little different models you can stick on the things to use for this. And for the transit authority activity, uh, it does two things. It demonstrates the transits of Venus and Mercury on our sun. And there's a transit of Mercury this November, I believe, on the 11th in the morning for folks in the U.S. Um, so at sunrise. Um, this also works to demonstrate uh, um, how de the detectors on Kepler and now TESS are measuring the brightness of stars to detect the planets, I'm not viewing the planets themselves. And I'll show that in one second. But first, um, yeah, pick your, uh, pick your little model. I'm going to pick the smallest little ball here to demonstrate a Mercury. And you can just see, yep, 
as it goes across the surface, you see the transit there. And you can also, um, with a group of people, you can ask this group if they all see the transit. And a lot of times, not everyone will. And that's great because that shows how precise the angle has to be for us here on Earth to, to witness a Venus or Mercury transit. And they're pretty rare. Um, they're not annual. It's every few years to every 100 years or so. Um, 112 years, I think, something like that for the next one for Venus. Um, you folks will know that better than me. Um, now, if you want to demonstrate um, like how hard it is to see further away, yeah, just walk back 20 feet and then like do the little ball there. And they'll have a hard time picking it up. And that's a good intro if you want to demonstrate how um, exoplanets are detected. And that's my last little bit here. You basically just take a little white card and set it up near the ball and by taking another uh, like object and paying attention to the card you notice that the overall brightness of the card decreases as the transit happens you can use different sizes of planets for different amounts of brightness decreasing and that's basically it and that's all i got for that one and uh, yeah just Look out for that Mercury uh, transit and uh, hope you all have good weather for that in November. <laughs> Cross fingers there. <laughs> and that's it. Cool. Yeah, it's interesting because we didn't use, unfortunately the stars are so far away, we can't see the, the transit itself like we can see for Mercury or Venus, but we mm -hmm. can see how the light dims a little bit and that's the difference there. Yeah, that's the big thing for, um, like when, uh, for a lot of Kepler and TESS outreaches, emphasizing that even though they're space telescopes, they're not looking at the exoplanets. They're looking at like the evidence of them, but not directly. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I'm next. And I was just going to show, um, we, have, we get a question a lot about when's the best time to view the moon. Isn't the full moon a great time to view the moon? And as we all know, it'll blow your eyeballs out if you look at it through a telescope or even binoculars. So uh, one of the best times to view the moon is not during full moon. And um, as you see, if you shine a light um, like this, seeing the sun on a ball, even this is a little bit wild because it's uh, overexposing on this video, but you'll see that you don't see too much detail. Right here, I've got a model of the moon. You can make these in flower. You can uh, do all, have a really good time. The write-up's got a lot of ideas there. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? This rain is really loud. <laughs> um, okay. Vivian, if you could, uh, it could be that you've got, uh, you know, the model in front of your microphone, <laughs> or if you could bump up the gain on your microphone, that would be great. Yep. Okay, I'll talk a little bit louder to start with. I hope that's a little better. Um, well, you can see um, when you hold the flashlight at the side, you see so much more detail on the moon when it's in a phase as opposed to a full moon, uh, when it's in a smaller phase than the full moon, I guess. Um, and this is just showing why it's uh, best to look at the moon when it's not a full moon, um, which is counterintuitive to a lot of people. Um, there are a lot of different ways of doing this, and in our new moon toolkit, um, we'll, we hope to include some of the 3D models that um, that NASA has put out. If you look at the uh, spotting craters activity that um, Dave just put up, you'll see there's a link to, you can make a 3D model of the lunar surface if you've got access to that. Often libraries will have access to 3D printers and you can make a, a lunar surface that you can use. It's not quite as messy as the flower and um, cocoa model that we all, that's also really fun, um, but not always um, uh, an easy way to do that. Okay, so that was the last of my bit in the dark. Um, it's also, you see a lot more wrinkles when you are at a phase. It turns out much better for a full moon. <laughs> the full moon helps reveal the magic of Instagram filters and um, TV lighting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, that's me next. All right. So I have a couple more, and these are going to be super brief because they're all pretty informal. Um, this next one is called "Where Are the Sunlight Stars?" St Sunlike stars. And it's a PowerPoint presentation. Um, you can download it um, from the nice I'll put the link up um, after I'm done 
So I'll just put it up right now. And it's you can download it right here. And what it basically does is you don't need to use the PowerPoint. Basically, there's it's just an activity to discuss with folks um, how rare our uh, our type the sun the type of star our sun is actually is. Um, it's not the most common star in the universe, and it's not the rarest, um, but uh, it is pretty special. And as far as we know, it's the most conducive to life. There's of course debates about that, and you know, the life might exist anywhere. We don't know. Um, but the big thing is uh, the stars that you're seeing in the night sky, they're almost all giant stars, um, which are about 1% of the uh, uh, star types out that are visible for us. Yep, there's only two other sunlight stars that we can see naked eye in the sky um, from where we are, and it's uh, Eta, Cassiopeia, and um, Tau Ceti. Uh, if you're in the southern hemisphere, you can see the Alpha Centauri uh, stars as well. Not Proxima, which is actually the closest one. Um, so that's kind of that. I just put the download link for that PowerPoint there. Um, the other big one, so the next one is what is a habitable zone? This is a great one for scouts. If you're doing like a, a camp activity, you can actually kind of incorporate the uh, campfire into discussing the habitable zone. But you know, if you don't have a campfire or you're restricted from fires, you, of course we can, you can simulate it with cellophane or some other fire equivalent um, um, for our, our sun a little candle for a dwarf star. You can kind of walk through, it's like, they call the habitable zone the Goldilocks zone, because um, it's where liquid water is, it's the temperature is not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right for liquid water to exist on a planet similar to Earth in this particular area around the star. So if someone is standing very close to the um, fire, you know, or your fake fire, it's going to be kind of like mercury, barren and dry, way too hot for any kind of water. If it's too far out, it's going to kind of be like Mars or any of the outer planets, way too cold. Any you know, water there is ice. You can mix it up by having people put on jackets and stuff to simulate atmospheres. So that kind of changes things a little bit about habitability too and how we view it. Um, and yeah, you can use a regular candle or a little like this that we include in the kit or a fancy little LED candle from the uh, dollar store um, to kind of simulate what a dwarf star and its very tiny habitable zone would be um, compared to our suns. You can always like make a giant, giant star and ask how big that habitable zone will be. That's basically it. It's a, it's a fun little interactive demo and it's pretty loose and um, great for audience participation. And uh, that's it for me. And I'll put the notes in the, the link in there too. Great, thank you. So that's kind of a survey about a lot of the activities that are in the toolkit. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to hear from all of you. And that's the beauty of using this format rather than the format that we use for the science webinars is that we can hear from you. So we'd like to find out about how you go about using these activities, how you go about engaging people uh, around these sorts of phenomena that we're looking at any kind of misconceptions that a lot of the people um, might have that come to your events. And so let's uh, kind of see if we can hear from uh, some of you. I hadn't heard about Capella, so I just put that, I just, Michael, I looked it up to see. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny. It's like with Alpha Centauri, like it's a binary, but the star is a G type, and so is a uh, it's a G three according to uh, Wikipedia for Capella. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Don. I'll speak up. I've got a terrible cold. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Michael, let me start over. Let's see if I can cut back in. Yeah, one comment about um, one thing we had talked about. Um, someone mentioned about the flower, and uh, I agree that the. Uh, the 3D models are far better than the, the flower. Uh, one of the things with um, a lot of people having gluten allergies, sometimes it's, uh, it's frowned on for having flour at some things because uh, you never know. Um. I've done the um, phases with uh, all different groups, schools and 
Girl Scout troops and stuff. Problem I always have is uh, I could really only work with about six students at a time. Uh, you know, I tried once in a whole classroom, so that doesn't work because it's difficult for uh, the students to see it. So usually the students are sitting like in tables of six or so, uh, and that works out so much better. So I just move my lamp over to the small table and then work with that small group. Yeah, it is a challenge working with large groups, especially since so many classes these days tend to be so large. Um, we like to, if you can clear out the tables or find a, a large open space and put the lamp in the middle and kind of make a, a big circle, uh, an extended circle around the lamp. And that way you can look across and everyone can see each other, everyone can see you. And so that's something that we've done with large groups. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a class, but maybe it could be even in an informal setting if you have a large group outside, say at some outdoor event. And so that's that's one way that, that we've been able to overcome that. But uh, certainly working in small groups is uh, is always good because then they can explore some of their own ideas. Yeah, that's a good idea. Also, when we've done our uh, public uh, meetings up on Mount Diablo, uh, just uh, towards sunset, um, doing that activity works really good because the sun is somewhat dim and you, then you could do a bigger group. Oh yeah. Uh, what Ken said, it was having trouble with, uh, with a large group. I've done it in the library with a, a whole bunch of families and I used a pole lamp it illuminated the light in all directions and everybody had a stick with a sphere on it and everybody would do the phases around their head by standing in a circle around the light and that seemed to work with a large group. Great, that's a good idea. Also, I'll, to share what I've done with that kit, with that toolkit, um, there's a question, why don't you have a fa uh, uh, an eclipse every time there's a new moon and a, and a full moon? And there's a, a really cool thing that you construct in the toolkit that shows the way they, the moon's orbit is angled. And it's got, you use a light around a table and you watch the shadow and you have this little moon going around a bigger sphere. And we made a whole bunch of extra ones of those. We, we bought, hemispheres and and we velcroed them together and we and we used uh, CDs and uh, we made a whole we made 24 of them and I've done it with a large a large group of young astronomers where they sit around se separate tables with uh, with lamps little lights around in the middle of each table and and it worked we were able to demonstrate that only only one person would see the, an eclipse around the table when the when the moon went into that little node spot. Yes, that's what we did. Except the uh, the Earth models, which are the larger white sphere, were on sticks, and they they were able to turn the moon around, you know, revolve the moon around the Earth. And it worked. It worked very well. I had my biggest problem was to buy extra lights. I wound up buying these little, uh, I don't know, these little holiday things. I don't remember what I used, but uh, that would stand on the table. It worked very well. That's fantastic. Cool. Michael was talking about in the chat about the three D models that NASA has. They have an amazing repository of models. Um, mm -hmm. You print all sorts of things if you get um, a 3D printer or have access to one. It's been really fun to have models of each of these things and talk about where the Hubble Space Telescope is, for example, or um, something that you're seeing on the moon, too. Uh, great. Uh, Don, uh, great. Yeah, if you would like some more toolkits, send us an email and let us know 
Um, we're happy to get you any that you need that you don't have yet. Um, as long as you're actively logging events, we're thrilled to send more. So there are lots of them. We have, we've made about a dozen. This is one of, uh, this is our second toolkit um, talk. Uh, but uh, there are, I think there are nine that are available currently. So they're listed on the website? They are listed on the website, yes. Okay. So back to the 3D models, and, and we're going to have something, some instructions in the new toolkit that we're working on, on, on the moon. Um, and we'll probably, at some point, once we get the uh, instructions that are easy to follow, um, both the Lunar Trek, and so there's two sites on NASA, Lunar Trek and Mars Trek. And they're really, really uh, high resolution with all the different data sets from all the different missions. And they have a function in there where you can actually generate your own files to, that you can convert into uh, and then use with a 3D printer to print out any feature that you want off the moon or off of Mars. And so at some point, um, we're going to ask uh, our good friend Brian Day, who is one of the developers of them, to get us some good directions that are easy to follow. Um, and we'll be posting those at some point. Yeah, thanks for posting those two links, Dave. You can actually, if you just get on to, I've done it on Lunar Trek, I haven't done the Mars Trek yet, but you can actually just make a, um, a, a some sort of rectangle and say, give me the file to print this, and it will give it to you in one of two forms. So it's really easy um, to make happen. I, I don't even do 3D printing, and I could do it. <laughs> Sometimes finding the command is a little uh, um, challenging for people, and so having a screenshot of saying, click on this, sometimes is uh, necessary. But we will get that at some point. And Michael, I completely agree about getting the visitors to actually handle all of the materials. That is so engaging, and so much more so than showing the demo, actually asking them to figure it out on their own, way more interesting. And they remember it way better because they have discovered something on their own. I agree. Especially like doing things like, do you want to be the moon? Do you want to be Venus or a planet or whatever? It's kind of fun to add that little bit. That's something I've done with the, uh, uh, the yardstick activity is uh, I actually went out and bought uh, additional kits so of uh, the yardstick activity. So I have a total of nine. Um, a lot of people might know that the Girl Scouts now have their uh, science explorer activities that they're working on. And uh, one of them is to work on uh, identify and do the earth moon scale. So I would set out all the yardsticks and I actually got the full size yardsticks because those are a little bit easier for the kids to handle. And uh, on the other uh, little thing that I did was I glued the uh, balls on top of the uh, toothpicks so um, they don't get lost that way because um, a lot of people will find that those balls are easy to get lost. And uh, you set them out on a table and you talk them through that activity and have the kids actually work in groups of two or however many kids you have so they can work together and uh, and uh, working through the exercise of getting the right scale and then they can do the eclipse activities and things like that. Then the other thing that we do is I have a basketball and a tennis ball. So then, you know, you have somebody be the earth and somebody be the moon and the kids can try to figure out how far away are, is the basketball from the tennis ball so that we have that scale. So that now they have a pretty good idea about how far it is and they, they can get pretty close. And then we can measure it with a measuring tape about it actually how far that is, which is like 23.1 feet, I think, something like that. So, so that's what we do for, for that activity. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just mention is I, I use the moon handout a lot. I find that is one of the best uh, moon handouts that we have um, to print out and have available for people. They like to take things home and it gives them something in their hands as they're going around. Most of our outreach, uh, Star parties have some component of the moon up in the sky so they can uh, have that handout with them when they're uh, going to the different telescopes looking at the moon. So that's what, that's what we're doing here.
Is there anything missing from that handout that you would like? We're going to do some updates for the 50th anniversary, and that was one of the things we were thinking about. If you guys have other things that you'd love to see on there, if you can think of them now, let us know, or if you think of them later, send an email. That would be great. We'll I love what David's doing with uh, the Artsic Eclipses. We do some similar things in our uh, teacher professional development that we do. One of the things that we do as far as getting into the scale is we'll give each group, each pair of teachers, a different baggie with a set of three balls, kind of like what I showed here. But they're not the identical three balls, so that you kind of get away from having somebody be able to, oh, gee, I don't know which one I should choose. And then they look over, well, what did they choose? Oh, they've got a completely different set of balls than I do, and so I can't uh, kind of you know figure out what I'm. So they actually have to rely on themselves to be able to come up with some sort of um, you know their own model rather than getting someone else's model. And so that's something that that we've done um, as far as the scaling activities. And so David, it, it's I, I love what you're doing with the Girl Scout groups. Being able to have those ratios allows you to do it at any size you want. Well, and this is what it, what it does too, is that um, if you've done anything about the angular size of the moon and you realize and, and that it's about, you know, if the real moon is up and you hold your pinky out, it turns out it's about half a pinky. And so if you've made your scale model correctly, and so you put the earth here where your eye is and you got the moon out there, stick your finger out here, and the moon is about half a pinky. And so it's an interesting check that you can make. It doesn't matter what size the balls are, or what the distance are, as long as the ratios uh, and the scaling is correct. Every single time you have that, if you're using the tennis ball and the basketball, then if you're where the basketball is, the tennis ball will be about that big. If you're using the one inch and the quarter inch bead, the bead will be about that big. So it's just that one is a whole lot closer. Can you all hear me? Yep. Okay. I was just, I was just saying that uh, in all the outreach that I was doing, the um, I never had any real problems with the balls and anything along those lines. But my problem was mainly with the uh, with the light source. Um, most of the light sources that that I had or had access to, even LED flashlights, had a tendency to have really soft edges and really be uh, kind of a broad beam. So it was really hard to kind of show the the really sharp edges, you know, especially whenever you're talking about uh, like a solar eclipse and things along those lines. And so uh, I just uh, sort of I sort of uh, solved it. I had a friend of mine kind of build a, a flashlight with some high powered LEDs, and I actually made like a filter slide to go in front of it. And I could then uh, punch the whole sizes that I wanted in various millimeter sizes, and I could make the aperture the size that I wanted, and uh, I could then adjust it accordingly for whatever type of particular um, demonstration I was doing, and that seemed to work really well. I just thought I'd pass that along. I, I don't know where you could buy something like that. Like I said, I had a friend of mine, electronics guy, that built it. For me, but uh, the aperture, I, the apertures in front of the, uh, the light source definitely helped a whole lot. Yeah, and as Vivian notes, our favorite uh, light source is the sun. You know, the sun is far enough away, and it's strong enough, and and it's small enough. It's it doesn't have that breadth, and so you're always end up with nice sharp shadows as long as you don't have clouds. Yeah, well, I was I was mainly talking about when you know a lot of times I'll give talks in the evening, and you yeah. just don't have that source. So one thing that um, if you if you know anyone that has an, an old overhead projector, uh, get one of those. Those things uh, actually work fairly well. Um, they, they're, they become rare commodities these days, but sometimes you can find them used and get them for not very much. Or maybe they're giving them away too, you never know. A computer, a computer projector works too, especially if it's far away. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say that as well, that the uh, the regular, you know, 3200 lumens projector, that light is bright enough that you can do a pretty good uh, 
uh, shadow uh, for that act activity. The other thing that I have is I bought like the most powerful lumen flashlight, I think like a thousand lumen flashlight I got from uh, a hardware store and uh, that works pretty good, but you have to, you know, have somebody play with you to, to get those shadows to work just right. You know, this would be the sort of thing, if, if any of you have constructed any of these devices, we would love to be able to have you share some images or maybe something, Vivian, I don't know whether we have a means for people to share some of these ideas, um, but I would love to be able to, you know, see some pictures and, and uh, be able to have people share some of these great ideas that they have. Yeah, Dave has written up some really cool articles on hacks that people have done to the um, Night Sky Network toolkits. And there are some really great ones, places where you can put, uh, um, oh, hey, look, somebody's sharing their screen. Who is this? That's great. Brandon, look at that. Cool. Oh, yeah, it's got the full solar system kit and everything. Wonderful. Um, yeah, there were some great banner holders that people had constructed. Yeah, please send them along and we'll, um, we'll write that up. We always like to be able to, uh, you know, give kudos out to the groups and uh, uh, love to put your pictures of what you're doing in the newsletters. You know, it gets boring when you just see pictures of us. We want to see pictures of what you guys are doing. I'll put the pictures up if you send them in to Night Sky Info. And I, I'll often try to find them in the logs, too. There's always so many good pictures in the logs, and we're working in a way and then future update to the website for folks to more easily share pictures and logs if they want or records of their events but that's kind of far in the future at the moment but for now yes like stuff they've done with toolkits toolkit hacks I like to call them uh, i like to write them up in articles and post them in the newsletter share them on instagram and social media and stuff but yeah please send us your your hacks you send us your, your toolkits in use. We love them. And if there's a good picture, we might even use it as one of the toolkit images on the resource page, too. We like to keep them updated and fresh. And to show people actually, you know, what they're using them in, in the real world, too, which is always fun. It's better than a couple of hands holding a ball or something, which works, but, you know, it's fun to see people are learning. All right, do we have anything from anyone else? Yeah, I don't know. We're, I just got an, um, I like, just our, our internet here at the office apparently has become unstable, maybe the storm or something. So, um, it happens when it rains a lot in, in our area in San Francisco, we get sometimes some, some flaky connectivity. Sometimes we get flooded. Not today yet, though. But, oh, Gerilyn, are you showing sorry up? Sorry about that, folks. I think Gerilyn's got one of her creations okay. with her. Yeah, I was wanting to mention, today I just used this. I made this little light box, if you can see that. It has a tiny little, uh, like a floodlight, and I used the, uh, the yardstick uh eclipse thing and and i used the dry erase board to cast a shadow upon or in any whiteboard i suppose would work but what, it, what i really liked about it it gave a really nice umbra and penumbra so you can actually see that and i can describe that to them too and it kind of looks like a kind of like a real scenario so i really enjoyed that and this light seemed to give me that effect well, you get both penumbra and number. Wow, that's great. That's hard to do. Yeah, it looked really nice. Cool. It's very defined, and you can really describe it to them. Because when you tell them about it, they just don't understand or grasp what you're saying. But I was actually able to show it to them, and okay. so they really understood it. And the I even got some wow. Next time you do that, if you could get a, a photo of that, I'd love to see a photo of that in action. Oh, yeah, sure. I will do that. Thank you. And Don's asking what kind of bulb you're using. Well, let's see. Let me check it out here. I made this little box and it's really kind of handy. It's, it's got a little light switch on it. It's on this side. 
And I want to put a dimmer switch in it because it looks it works really well if you put a red light in it if you're doing something out, outside and you got a, a nice big moon and you kind of use the red light to kind of illuminate things if you want to. But it's just a it's just a little bitty like a floodlight, but it's a smaller one. And it's uh looks like it's a a 40 water, 45, 48 watts, really? 45 wow. watts. So it's it's not a very big one, but it works great. Is it an LED? I see that. That is it an LED or a halogen? No, it's just it's an incandescent. Okay. So it gets really hot. So don't try to take it out of your pocket till it cools off. <laughs> But the kids really enjoyed that demonstration when I did it for them today. And I had like four of the uh, yardsticks, and so they all got to play with it and try to demonstrate and create their little eclipses. You know, I almost think I hear a, a telescope slewing there. Oh, it's my laptop because I'm, oh, I'm using my is? laptop and it's overheating. Okay. It gets, it gets warm. It's an ancient laptop. <laughs> I wish you guys all clear skies and not too much snow or cold. Michael was just saying his wind chills predicted to be negative 10 on Sunday. Wow. I, that is some fierce determination you have if you're getting out to view it then. Maybe you can view it from your window. A warm window. I hope you guys have clear, clear skies. <laughs> That's remarkable. We're really spoiled here, temperature-wise, anyway. Temperature-wise, <laughs> not fog-wise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One so, thing my students ask a lot of questions about is how come the lunar eclipse is red? And we've had them try different things, but we've taken fish tanks and not no fish, just an empty fish tank with water in it and shine a white light through it and you can do it with incandescent or probably led i haven't tried it with an led but i think it would work and then you add a couple of drops of milk to it and you will start to see the more milk you add it gets redder and redder so they get the idea that there have to be particles that are what are they doing slowing down the light and that's your longer wavelengths All right, we got time for another uh, person to share. I'll share one other thing. Uh, I haven't done the activity itself yet, the transits, uh, but I'm going to be doing that at one of our next activities. But uh, I was had a darn heck of a time trying to get a hole through the ping pong ball to get the snake light through. So what I ended up doing, I I worked a, I got a pen light with a, you know, it has a bright light at the end and I found some uh, clear replaceable like poster material, whatever that stuff is called. And uh, you put that on top of the light, the light can shine right through. And then you put the ping pong ball right on top of that. And that lights up the, the whole ping pong ball. So uh, I was able to, uh, um, do that activity um, without having to uh, drill into a ping pong ball and and do all that sort of thing. So that's just one other thing I that I have set up to do. Yeah, that's a good one. All right. Well, we're a couple minutes here uh, up to the hour, and so Dave and Vivian, any uh, closing comments from either of you? Just thanks to everybody. It's really nice to see your faces and hear your voices. Good luck with the weather on Sunday. Yes. <laughs> Stay right. toasty. Right. Well, that's all for tonight. You'll be able to find this webinar along with many others on the Night Sky Network website in the Outreach Resources section. Each webinar's page also features additional resources 
and activities.